This is the Lou Rockwell Show. Dr. Walter Block is professor of economics at Loyola University in New Orleans, where he holds the Harold E. Worth Chair. He's a senior fellow at the Mises Institute, author of hundreds and hundreds of articles, many books, and he has a, a book forthcoming on the privatization of roads and streets. And Walter, it's always struck me as Americans seem oblivious to how many socialist institutions exist in our allegedly free market society, one of them, of course, being roads and streets. Talk to us a little bit about you know, the effects of a socialist road and street system and what would be the benefits of making it a private enterprise one. Speaking of road socialism, I was once in a debate with Milton Friedman, and I had occasion to call him a road socialist because he favors government roads, and he didn't like it being put quite that way. But then he sort of saw it, and he's a gentleman. He said, yes, I am a road socialist. And I don't know, I thought that that should have ended the the debate, but (laughs) somehow it didn't. I have two main motivations for my writing and speaking out on this issue by far the the foremost one is the fact that 40,000 people a year die on the nation's highways. Now, if they were private, if the uh, U.S. highways, roads, and streets were private and 40,000 people were dying on them, you know Teddy Kennedy be ha- holding hearings and greed and, and profits and uh, all sorts of things like capitalism would be brought about and, and excoriated because, you know, 40,000 people are dying. But uh, since it's government roads or socialist roads, we, we uh, it's sort of like the fish in the sea. They're not aware of the water or we're not aware of the air unless it's polluted or something. Uh, roads, it's sort of like death and taxes. It, it seemed as inevitable. I mean, you have to have government roads, don't you? I mean, yes, they're, they're doing a little bit better in terms of deaths per mile, uh, per passenger mile, and that's true. But still, 40,000 people a year are dying roughly every year since, I don't know when, in the 70s. This is horrible. And what they do is they blame it on things like uh, drunken driving and uh, speeding and vehicle malfunction. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has about 125 such causes. Nothing having to do with government. It's not government's fault. It's all these other things like how far the the road is from the hospital and, and what's the response time of the ambulance and do they have helicopters as ambulances and, you know, very minute little details. Uh, The way I put this in my writings is that they're confusing uh, ultimate cause with proximate cause. Yes, of course, the proximate cause of these things, but the ultimate cause is government management or government mismanagement, which doesn't deal with the drunken or the speeding or this or that. Uh, The analogy I sometimes use is suppose a restaurant goes broke, and we say that the reason the restaurant went broke is because location, 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 they were you know, in a cul-de-sac and nobody could get to them, or uh, they had bad cooks or bad chefs or bad uh, uh, waitresses or the place wasn't clean or it was unruly or whatever. And we wouldn't for a moment ex- accept this as a uh, causal explanation of why the restaurant went broke. Rather, we'd say it was management. Management didn't locate in the proper area. Management didn't hire a good chef. Management didn't hire a waitress who wasn't surly or whatever. Management didn't get some guy with a broom and tell him to go do his thing. Management, management, management. And yet, most people, when it comes to the roads, they don't see the analogy. And it's a perfect analogy. It's management that is screwing up. Walter, coming from Massachusetts, I was always struck by how many billions of dollars must be stolen from automobile owners every year by the salt they put on the roads. And everybody just accepts this as as if it's coming from the planet Mars that uh, rots out your car and sometimes kills people because it actually, on an older vehicle, sometimes causes the whole bottom to fall out. And yet again, people just accept this as, as part of the socialist... Uh, road project, social assaulting of the socialist road. <laughs> social assault. Please pass the social <laughs> assault. Uh, you know, I live some months a year in Vancouver, and in Vancouver is a very hilly place. And sometimes the driveways up to a house are a very steep incline. And what they do there is they don't put salt there, but they have underneath the cement, they have this uh, metal heaters or something. And it heats the the stuff so that there's no snow on the sharp inclines. Now, I don't know whether uh, salt or sand or mining the cement roads with metallic things that heats up the road are the best ways. And we don't know. We're not central planners. Maybe salt is the best way as far as we know. The point is, though, if you don't have competition, if you don't have private property, you're in a central planning modality. You're like the Soviet system. 
And we have no way of saying for sure whether it's salt, sand, uh, heaters, metal heaters, or some fourth way. All we know as economists, and I'm not a road entrepreneur, so I don't really know which way is the best way. I, I'm not a restaurant entrepreneur, so I don't know who the best cook is or the best location for a restaurant. I do know as an economist that competition brings about a better product. And when you have um, different road owners uh, deciding these things, uh, speed limits, um, how fast the people should go, and what's the variability of speed and all, all that, then you get a better product. I mean, we get a better product with wristwatches and pens and shirts and ties, even though we don't know how to make wristwatches and pens and shirts and ties, you and I, we're not entrepreneurs of those things. But competition brings about a better product. I wanted to mention the other motivation beside deaths, and I think that if private enterprise uh, would do it, uh, our death rate would go from about 40,000 to about 10,000. That, that's my rough estimate, just the seat of the pants. So we'd save 30,000 lives a year. My other motivation is the traffic congestion. It's not so bad here in Auburn, Alabama, although the, during those football games, you know, <laughs> we, we can, our congestion here in Auburn uh, can match any, any congestion anywhere. But places like New York or uh, Los Angeles, I mean, the, the fastest way around some of these places is either walking or jogging or uh, not ice skates, uh, roller skates or something like that. It's, it's just horrendous. And the solution to congestion is peak load pricing. Namely, you charge more during the, the high demand and less during the low demand. Uh, just like a restaurant or a movie theater or whatever, a lot of restaurants will charge less for lunch than dinner because the dinner is peak uh, demand, whatever. But the government, in its brilliance, uh, does anti-peak load pricing. Namely, they exacerbate the thing. They, they charge less during the rush hours and more during the off-peak. And the way they do that is with bridges and tunnels. They'll give you a monthly pass or something where you, you can use it uh, 25 times a month or something like that. And you go through this easy pass stuff. It's a little cheaper for the commuters, the regular commuters. But when do the regular commuters commute? They commute during rush hour. So what the government is doing is lowering the price during the rush hour which exacerbates traffic congestion. And the mayor of New York City, Bloomberg, is uh, trying, he's trying to uh, raise prices in Manhattan for a car, which is a move in the direction of free enterprise, but then again, he's, he's not gonna lose money if he does badly. He can't go broke uh, based on how well he deals with traffic congestion. The whole thing is silly. Whereas if we had private people doing this, we, we would have much less traffic congestion. We'd be able to, to move around the, these high traffic, uh, high occupancy vehicle, HOV lanes. Uh, they don't work too well. Uh, what happens is that uh, when there's a uh, traffic congestion, uh, the people in the, the middle lane, what they do is they bunch up bumper to bumper so the people can't get off because they're ticked off at them for going past them. And uh, the easy uh, uh, pay lanes, what they do is they, in order to uh, queue jump, to, to pay for coins uh, w with a coin, they get into those lanes so that they can sneak onto the other lanes. So that doesn't work either. Uh, probably what a private enterprise person would do would not just based on how many people you have there, that's socialism, but rather based on uh, how much you're willing to pay. And if you're willing to pay a lot of money, uh, then you get in the high occupancy vehicle lane. And there would be very uh, uh, stiff penalties for people who bunched up so they wouldn't let them off the lane. Uh, in other words, uh, look, these are the people that run the post office. These are the people that run FEMA. I'm from New Orleans, and we have a bumper sticker there, FEMA happens, you know. I mean, FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers together killed, what, 1,100 people in the post-Katrina era? And they're still in business. Well, these are the people, the ones that run the, the Motor Vehicle Bureau and, and the Post Office and FEMA and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. They're the ones in charge of the roads. So why should we expect any reasonable um, activity in terms of deaths or congestion? Walter, I have on my wall in my office at home a newspaper from late 18th century Massachusetts. And the bottom of the front page is full of classified ads advertising uh, lotteries for building turnpikes to Newburyport and and other places. And of course, they didn't have as developed a stock market in those days. So I doubt that people would do it through lotteries now. But there were private roads. This is not something from science fiction. Private roads have existed, have been built, except of course, they're built where entrepreneurs think they ought to be built, where they're going to serve consumers. Whereas as we know, roads today are built where the government planners think they ought to be built. But 
just by the merest happenstance, I'm sure the location of the roads tend to enrich certain landowners and business owners who are close to the politicians making the decisions about where the road goes. And if where you put, say, an intersection on a, on a major highway can either enrich some people and, um, and impoverish other people. So you have those kinds of considerations as well with socialist roads. Lou, I'm shocked that you're so cynical. Surely our government does things that's in the public good. I, I don't know what, what you people are teaching here at the Mises Institute. Suspicion of government? This is uh, unacceptable. No, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, you're quite right that the earliest roads were turnpike roads. Uh, my own research in the U.S. goes right back to the Revolutionary War times and even before that, the, where there were turnpike roads. And in England, uh, as early as the 7th or 8th century, there were private roads there. People would pick up themselves, get up on their hind legs, and build a road from A to B, and then they would charge people. It was a very nice system. Now, this is long before the era of cement or a macadam road or a tar or anything like that. It was just dirt roads. Sometimes they'd have boards there. But but what they would do is they would charge based on how many axles, what the weight was, how many horses, and they would even charge on based on the width of the wheel. If the wheel was very narrow, think ice skates, they would charge more because you'd put ruts in the road. Whereas the, if the wheel was wide, think steamrollers, they would charge less because you sort of flatten out the ruts in the road. So it was a very nice system. Well, why, why didn't it succeed? Why didn't it continue? Because the, the bloody government wouldn't uphold property rights. Namely, what they would do is every mile or two, they'd have a turnpike where you'd put a coin in or pay the guy for the use of the road. And people started uh, avoiding them and you know not paying. And when they called in the government, uh, who supposedly uh, demanded or had a monopoly of uh, defensive force or what have you, they refused to uphold the... Uh, uh, these people. A very similar thing happened with uh, the subway system in New York City. There was the IRT and the BMT, which were private. The IND later came on, which was government. And what happened is that these were totally private railway systems underground, uh, the, the um, subway system in New York City, the IRT and the BMT. And they were charging a nickel apiece, a nickel entry, and they were going to raise it to a dime. And the government said, this is unconscionable. We can't have that. And what they did is, well, I won't say nationalized, but I'll say municipalized, namely the city government took them over. And guess what they did to the fair? You'll never guess. In a million years, <laughs> they raised it to a dime. So you're quite right that private roads were the first roads and, and nowadays when I lecture to students they just can't envision this. They think, you know, roads, it, it's got to be government somehow. Uh, now, the cynical point that you made uh, th that roads are placed where the politicians want them and where they can benefit from them. Uh, one of the most recent cases was this bridge to nowhere in Alaska where some congressman from or senator from Alaska wanted to build this uh, highway to serve, I don't know, nine or 15 people in some little hamlet and the thing would have cost, you know, a zillion dollars. Bridges are very expensive. That's just one tip of the iceberg, uh, but you're quite right that this is endemic. Uh, people get roads in, in Canada. The, the minister of highways, uh, he could be living out in the, in the boonies and you got 65,000 highways all, you know, near him because he determines where the highways go. I've uh, gotten involved in debates with people who you'd think were free enterprise but and have a reputation as being free enterprise, uh, free enterprise but aren't really free enterprise, and that is uh, Richard Epstein and Gordon Tullock. These are two people that I've managed to get into debates with. And both of them had to do with eminent domain, the idea that if you want to build a road from A to B, say from Auburn to New Orleans, it's, I don't know, a five-hour travel, say, 300 miles, something like that. Uh, how many people own property between here and there, between Auburn and New Orleans? I don't know, 10,000, uh, 20, 100,000 people own property? Well, if you're going to build a road, you're going to, uh, a private road, without eminent domain, which only the government can do, namely nationalizing land, the only way to do it is to go through the property of, say, 10,000 people. And there'll be some holdout who will say, not on my land, or sure, you can have my land for a road, but it'll cost you a trillion dollars or something like that. And there are various, uh, in my book, my forthcoming book with the Mises Institute, this is one, I think I devote an entire chapter to this problem. How could private roads work without eminent domain? Because eminent domain is just land seizure, and that's hardly compatible with free enterprise. 
And there are various ways. Uh, there are more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, there, there is, yes, the d most direct line between Auburn and New Orleans as the crow flies, but then you can make a little curve here and there. In other words, you, you could make a, a northern route or an eastern route or a southern route where you deviate by one degree or something and make a sort of a great circle line. I wish I had a blackboard I could illustrate, but I, I hope that the people out there in radio land will get the, the idea. Well, then what you do is you have maybe six or eight or ten op uh, paths between the two. Not, not that you have to go through Florida or you have to go through Montana. That would be too far away. But, you, you know, you can go through uh, Birmingham or you can go through, um, I don't know, some other city. Um. Okay, so now what you do is instead of buying up land, what you do is you buy up options to buy land. So you go to a farmer and you say, hey, farmer, I want to buy this land. And uh, how much will you sell it to me for? And he says, oh, 100000 You say, well, I don't, I'm not really sure I want to buy it, but I'd like to buy an option to buy it that I can exercise within a year. So uh, I'll pay you the 100000 uh, uh, but for this privilege of, of tying you up in a, con in a contract, I'll pay you $1,000. And the farmer agrees. And now what you do is you go along that road, and if a holdout occurs, well, then you just uh, abandon that, and you lose your, your money not to buy the land, but to buy these uh, contracts to buy the land, these options, which is much, much less than the sale price of the land. And that's one way to get rid of the problem. Now, Gordon Tullock once came up to me at some conference at Block. I hear you believe in private roads. I said, yes. He said, well, you can't do it because if you did it, suppose someone owned, uh, uh, say, a road from Boston to L.A. They could cut the country in half. And I said, but, you know, that's silly. Why would anyone want to build a road that nobody could get across uh, over through? He said, well, you're right. It wouldn't be economically viable, but it could still happen. So, uh, my son and I wrote this uh, reply or wrote this article addressing, let's take this question of, um, again, returning to um, Auburn to New Orleans. Suppose somebody owned a 300-mile stretch uh, going east and west so that no matter which of these routes we were planning on taking from New Orleans to Auburn or back, he would own the land. Namely, he, he would stop the thing cold because he owned all the, uh, the cross hatches or the cross uh, land. Well, now what can you do? Well, I have this other article um, with Nadia Nedzel in a, some law review, I forget offhand, where we say you can build a bridge over or under his land. Because libertarians don't believe in the ad column doctrine, A-D-C-O-E-L-U-M, ad column. This is the doctrine that if you own a square mile of land, you own all the land down into the core of the earth and up into the heavens. Well, that would make airplane travel a little dicey if you could charge airplanes for going over. Libertarians are more into homesteading, and since the farmer hasn't homesteaded 30,000 feet above his land, he has nothing to say about that, nor has he homesteaded the stuff 100 yards below his, his holdings. So uh, what you could do is just build a tunnel under this guy's land, and that would be a way out of it. But now we're getting into science fiction-ish kinds of things to sort of prove that no matter what objection anyone throws against, uh, against private roads, we can still do it without um, eminent domain. In, in more realistic circumstances, uh, what would happen is people are reasonable. People don't get to own large swatches of land who are weirdos. What they would say is, okay, look, um, you can have my land, but give me one-tenth of one percent of the um, shares of stock of the whole uh, road or, or something like that. On the other hand, to get back to science fiction, I have a, um, a soft spot in my heart for science fiction objections. I like to overcome them uh, just take the hard cases to show that the thing is viable. Well, you know, in, in many big cities, you'll find a gigantic skyscraper, and then there's this little dot of, of land where it's not part of the skyscraper. In other words, instead of a square or a, a rectangle, you'll have a rectangle or a square with a little bit cut out. And sometimes there'll be a house there, some old lady's house, and she didn't sell it out. Or sometimes there'll just be a little park, and, and you know that 20 years ago they finally knocked down the house. In the Soviet Union, you don't have that. You don't have that in any uh, totalitarian country. The U.S., with all of its faults, and, and there are many, many faults. Uh, somebody introduced last night uh, that there are people from non-rogue states also attending here, although there are plenty of people from, from the U.S. We are a rogue state in many ways, foreign policy mainly, uh, invading other countries and all. But in this regard, uh, the U.S. has some sort of 
vestigial attachment of private property such that you, you'll you find in cities where, where the, the land was not able to be amassed on the whole city block and there's this little thing and okay it's inefficient maybe from some architectural or geometric point of view but to me it's a thing of beauty because it indicates private property and private property rights are are pretty much tantamount to economic freedom. Walter thanks so much for being with us and I want to m- mention that not only is Walter a wonderful teacher as you've just heard but a wonderful writer as well. Take a look at his archive on therockwell.com, Walter Block, and you can see at the bottom of his articles will be uh, his books, uh, some of his books advertised. Read him, listen to him. Walter Block, thank you. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to The Lou Rockwell Show, produced by lourockwell.com, the best-read libertarian website in the world. If you'd like to advertise on this podcast or on the website, Email advertise at lourockwell.com. And thanks for listening.